I appreciate all of you coming uh, this evening. I know it's a beautiful evening out there. In fact, I would have liked to have taken a ride. Um, it's been very cold this year in Yerevan, and uh, uh, I left just as spring was coming. So hopefully next week there'll be some time to walk around. The uh, Uh, Manub made uh, the necessary correction with regard to the position I have. Uh, it happens to be with the government. It's not an independent kind of uh, think tank or institute or whatever. And uh, that's important because of uh, what is necessary for the government of Armenia today to improve in some areas the its ability to legislate and as well as develop policies and options. Um, there are a number of issues that could be covered in a presentation like this. I will not uh, necessarily go into everything uh, just as this department, uh, when it was imagined uh, for two years now, the government of Armenia under the previous regime as well as the new in trying to set up this, this department in some form or another, and yet uh, apparently there were some difficulties, uh, which I discovered later after they gave me the job and I accepted. I'm not sure I would have accepted had I known what had gone into the position, uh, but they're smart. You know, they're very smart. So um, just as everyone imagined it a certain way, because the needs are so great, uh, I think everyone expects a information on a particular kind of uh, a problem in Armenia. I will not speak too long so that I can give a chance uh, to everyone to ask questions. I will begin by saying that I am regarded as an optimist, and I do not regard that characterization as correct. Uh, intellectually, I am a pessimist. I don't expect much to happen, but somehow by temperament, I can't help but do something when I see the slightest possibility of doing something. So that's what I'm doing. Now, I may end up leaving you with the impression that everything is great in Armenia. I'll tell you it isn't. You know it isn't. But it may not be as bad when you're working and you're doing something there as it uh, may be when you're sitting here uh, and not having all the information. Therefore, I will speak on in two general uh, on two general topics. One is some of the characteristics of what's going on in general in nation building today, the characteristics of policies and strategies, and then some um, specifics on events in the last month or so, and that may lead into uh, specific questions as well as general questions. What is perceived to be happening in Armenia today is a very familiar process in world history that is nation building. That is the disintegration of existing structures which in the 19th century were largely imperial and into the 20th century are becoming largely national. And nation building involving specific geographies uh, and cultures and governmental structures in the case of Armenia which has not had a state for a long time. Uh, it uh, became a small republic in 1918, Sovietized in 1920. Uh, so that short period of independence didn't count for much. Generally speaking, Armenian political culture has been uh, one of a colony in, in the eastern part within the Russian Empire and the western part of the Ottoman Empire until the genocide. Nation building is the determination of the people of Armenia today to build a nation that is Armenia, a country that is Armenia, that is not part of any empire. This process of nation building uh, has become necessary in the view of the people of Armenia in order for uh, them to decide on their own what are the vital interests of the Armenian nation in Armenia and to determine with what strategy to pursue them and if there are goals which cannot be achieved because of the scarcity of resources of the Republic, then at what price to negotiate, which aspect, which purpose, when, how. 
not to allow anyone else to decide what is good for the Armenian nation or for Armenia, and not to allow for imperial powers to determine to distort the interests of Armenia in order to justify their imperial presence. This requires two things. One is independence, the other is democracy. Independence so that you have the ability to pursue your interests where you can, the way you can, and the way you decide you want to pursue them with the price you want to pay. Democracy in order to have a legitimate government that is elected, that has the mandate by the people to decide strategies. These two go together because imperial rule allows neither one nor the other and cannot allow one while disallowing the other. That is, you cannot have democracy in a colony. It is impossible because automatically democracy tends to elect people who start developing loyalties toward the public and the interests of the public or the people are articulated differently and eventually will come into conflict with the interests of an imperial power that tries to determine for the colonies what is best for them. The process of nation building is what is going on today. That means we are neither an independent republic nor totally a democratic republic yet. The declaration which was adopted in August of 1990 by the Parliament of Armenia was a declaration on independence, not of independence. That is, there's the recognition that independence is not achieved by sheer declaration. It is achieved by real steps, small ones, and it also depends on the recognition of the world of your independence. Therefore, the government's policy today is that independence is a process that must be achieved through political economic development. It may be accomplished within a year or within 10 years or 10, 20 years. It will depend on both the domestic processes as well as the rate of disintegration of the Soviet Empire. Therefore, we have in Armenia today, in most cases, a duality of power, de facto. You have, for example, a foreign ministry, which is part of the foreign ministry of the USSR. As a republic that tries to achieve independence and develop an independent foreign policy, reflecting Armenian interests, if you went to the foreign minister today, it's not clear whether he can sustain, whether he can pursue a strategy devised by his own government. Because structurally, organically, in terms of the information he receives, in terms of the relations he has with the rest of the world, the minister is in fact a functionary of the foreign ministry of the USSR. Therefore, it is very difficult to have a foreign policy <coughs> through the foreign minister. Therefore, the foreign policy of Armenia is developed largely by the president of the parliament, which means the president of the republic, in conjunction with the prime minister and the foreign minister and the uh, foreign affairs committee of the parliament. If you go to the state security agency or the KGB, the KGB is a Soviet agency. It continues to function. There are many splits in Moscow as well as in Yerevan. The local branch is ostensibly under the control of the Republic, but there is no way you can ever be sure, and there's no way that it is not also tied to the larger KGB. And you can go down the line. The only absolutely independent agency is the Parliament, and even that is relative in terms of what it can do, what it can legislate. Much of its legislation can be countermanded by Moscow, and often it is. Much of the confusion which American or other businessmen realize exists in Armenia with regard to laws of ownership, privatization, etc., comes not, therefore, from the lack of a will on the part of the parliament to legislate, but from its inability to enact legislation that is also applicable immediately and fully and reliably because 
currency is a Soviet currency, customs are Soviet customs, and there, there are ways by which the Soviet government weakens the power of the republics, even though it has very, very little immediate impact in, in the republics, particularly in Armenia. The parliament of Armenia was elected last summer, and uh, it was elected, uh, it has a majority led by the Armenian National Movement, which was uh, created by the Garabakh Committee. They have somewhere from 60 to 70 sometimes, most of the important legislation is passed with 80% of the vote of the parliament. So the ANM, the Armenian National Movement, without being a political organization or party as yet, does function more or less as one. It has under its wing a number of very, uh, organizations, cultural, environmental, uh, political, uh, and uh, it is that organization's philosophy that dominates the parliament today. The parliament has 16 standing committees and one special committee on Artsakh or Garabakh. The parliament is run by the presidium, that includes the president, the two vice presidents, the chairman of the committees. Next to the presidium, next to the elected members of the parliament, uh, are those that are uh, elected within the parliament, as I mentioned, the, par the presidium and the committees, they are elected by the full parliament. Then there is the department of which I am in charge, which is the department of research and analysis, which is brand new. And uh, then there are the functional departments of general administration, accounting, uh, typing, PR, etc., etc. On the other hand, you have the government, what is called the Garavarutun, as opposed to uh, the Kerakun uh, of the parliament. The Garavarutun is the cabinet, the prime minister being elected by the parliament and responsible and accountable to the parliament. The Prime Minister started appointing his ministers last uh, October, and yet he, uh, last September in fact, uh, and then he got the right to appoint them uh, as a collective. Most of the ministers are new, some of them are leftovers from the previous government. One minister is in a very peculiar situation, and that is the uh, Magyarchian, is the foreign minister, who was kept because Armenia did not have the necessary cadres to provide for all the ministries that were needed. That is, uh, people who were willing to take on the new philosophy of nation building, independence, and democracy, at the same time as have expertise in the field of the ministry they would lead and administrative capabilities. That became very, very difficult. So they kept more of the older ministers than they would have liked. But in the case of the foreign minister, for example, when he went on a mission with a Soviet foreign uh, ministry delegation, he made some pronouncements which were counter the government's policy, and he was asked not to come to the office. Uh, they did not dismiss him because he is very much part of the Soviet foreign ministry. So uh, they kept him, and yet they told him that he would make no more policy, and Ashodir Yazayan, his delegate, his assistant, is now in charge of that ministry, although it's not clear what will happen in the long run. But foreign policy is now largely the, uh, under the jurisdiction of the president. The two branches of government, there's still no third branch. The judicial branch, uh, like we have at the Supreme Court, does not exist. And uh, the, the judicial branch, in terms of the judges, is the branch uh, which is still very much under the control of the old guard. So there are some conflicts there. Uh, there are some differences that are developing, healthy differences between the parliament and the government. And uh, the, at first, it is difficult to see them because you have organic ties between the two. Most of the cabinet members are members of parliament. The Garapak committee and the people around them are in both, and in the, in the parliament uh, and uh, the government. And yet, we found, for example, in the case of Nayid, when the Prime Minister was thinking of the possibility of opening it again, no decision yet. He knew he couldn't make that decision on his own. 
and he knew people would not accept it unless there was a full debate in Parliament and the Parliament approved of it. When he came to Parliament, although the Parliament had not done its homework of research and analysis, because the Department was not there yet to do independent research, the Parliament refused to grant the, the Prime Minister the right to open night, asked him to go back with the more specific research and come back with a clear and uh, concise recommendation with regard to what to do, and then it would consider it. So it is very clear that the Parliament uh, will act as a watchdog over the government, and democracy demands that the two branches be uh, co-equal, uh, because otherwise in the modern world, particularly in republics where you have so many crises and emergencies, the executive branch comes, tends to take over. It has the means to do more research and ex provide expertise, and kind of uh, railroad the parliament to be adopting legislation. That hasn't happened in Armenia. We do have a very, very strong uh, prime minister, very intelligent prime minister, and he's very careful with regard to what needs to be done. But at the same time, the pressures of office are such that you cannot allow, just because it's Vasek and Manugyan, you cannot allow him to do what he thinks is right. The parliament must watch over the prime minister. The decision-making process in the government is still not too clear because the institutions are just developing. Some institutions are brand new, and those that are brand, brand new have the best chance of succeeding. Some have been invested with new power and authority, such as the parliament. The parliament used to exist. It was always there, the Kerakim Republic. It had a president, but it never assumed the role it has assumed today. That is, of real legislation, rather than calling the Central Committee of the Communist Party across the street and saying, what is it that you want, and passing the resolutions. The um, committees of the parliament are rather new, and some of them are working very well. <coughs> Many of them uh, have come to a standstill because they don't have the means to go any further without independent research and analysis, or without uh, further sophistication of the mechanisms of committee work. These uh, problems are resolved either by the imagination of the members or by comparative studies of other republics within the Union or outside the Union. But they're largely on their own. We're trying to create means for them to do, to provide very quick research on any aspect of the part of the uh, of uh, legislation, and that's part of the departments I'm uh, establishing now. That's part of its responsibility. But at the same time, uh, there are issues that cannot wait. There are also characters that cannot wait. When you have been a leader of the movement, a movement that has had a revolutionary character, you're suddenly elected to parliament and you become the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. It's very difficult to move from that kind of functioning to to an, a, a kind which requires institutionalization, collective decision-making with people you haven't worked with before. These are issues that are there every day. And sometimes decisions are made when an issue arises. It goes to the Foreign Affairs Committee, sometimes to the Prime Minister, sometimes to the President, or a Vice President. Now, they work together. They talk with each other constantly. And major issues are always debated fully. The Presidium of the Parliament meets at least once, sometimes four times a week. It decides on the fundamentals of the agenda of the Parliament, on the major issues to be brought up, the order of business, how to approach, how to define a problem, which facilitates the work of the Parliament. And that way, they, they, they often call in the Prime Minister, who sits into the Presidium meeting, or sometimes they have joint Cabinet and Presidium meeting. So that even though the separation of power is not all that clear, they know that these are two branches, and some decisions have to be made collectively, regardless as to what the fine legality may be. So that they take collective responsibility, and then they see who can do it best. At this moment, for example, we're negotiating an agreement with the state of California. We're developing a program for the diaspora. We're doing a number of things, but you see one of them is being led by one vice president, another is a minister, a third is the prime minister while all agreements should be developed by a cabinet member. It's an executive function. The policy at best is to be set up.
But it doesn't matter at this point. There's a shortage of cadres. These people trust each other. And my original concept that there should be a very clear separation, I realized would not work. You should always develop legislation and policy and institutionalize as if these are separate. But at the present time, it is very difficult for uh, the president or the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee not to pick up the phone and talk to the prime minister or the uh, deputy prime minister when they've worked together for years and they know each other just because he's deputy prime minister it doesn't mean he's going to stop talking to them. So the decision making is very fluid. It is gradually clearing up, but it is not uh, as easy as uh, it appears when there are organic ties, when these decisions require full support from each other, when knowledge is limited, knowledge, particularly information, is limited, so they end up working together much more and confusing roles much more. Uh, sometimes this is very healthy, sometimes it is not. Some of the things that are happening now will create problems in the future. Uh, but at the same time, there seems to be no way of avoiding it. The government, in general, has a policy of non-confrontation with Moscow. That is, it does not consider it useful to make dogmatic, ideological, non-flexible statements or adopting policies which will uh, force Armenia into a corner and uh, give nothing to Armenia. For example, with regard to the draft, this was a major issue, particularly when the, no the Soviet army is notorious for mistreating its soldiers. And particularly when Armenian soldiers serve in Kazakhstan, Kazakh soldiers serve in Georgia, Georgian soldiers in it's it was a Byzantine kind of setup, and the movement was very much against it. The movement demanded that Armenians serve in, in Armenia. And they were able to convince the Soviet army of it. They also thought, the movement, now the government, that it is, although it is desirable to have an Armenian army, a national army completely under the command of the parliament, and there is a small unit of about a thousand now that is such. At the same time, it's very difficult to arm and train and equip an army that is a serious army. Consequently, they found this way of agreeing with the Soviet army that Armenians will serve in Armenia, will be trained in Armenia, will be equipped in Armenia. Unless they want to go somewhere else and serve, then it's an individual decision. As a policy, Armenians remain in Armenia. In return, they promised the Soviet army that they will guarantee that the draftees will enlist and serve the army. And I mention this because this was one of the major issues two weeks ago with Baru Hari gun demonstrations and troubles. And I'll cover that a little later. This, in the view of the government, allows, at the present time, there are 20,000 Armenians serving in the Soviet army in Armenia. The number should be 40,000. The Soviet army in Armenia is not uh, fully equipped today. There's less soldiers than there should be. And the government passed a law when it examined the Hairigan situation that those draftees that do not enlist will be considered uh, a wall and will be charged accordingly. And the Republic assumed the responsibility for uh, prosecution of these cases, saying this is a national defense issue, this is the way the Parliament has decided to deal with that problem today, and that's how we're going to do it. <coughs> the government has also a policy of not making any single issue a litmus test of anything with Moscow. This is also very important, because this is how in many of the republics, Moscow has been able to bring destabilization. And this is a major issue with regard to Artsakh or Garapa. That is, if the government of Armenia today decided that unless Moscow changes its policy with regard to Artsakh, then Armenia is in a state of war or something with Moscow, then there's nothing else that will happen. And this is, in fact, what Moscow has tried to do in the republics, to force governments to focus on one issue where it has superiority, where it has the power to manipulate. And the government, at the cost of much criticism and misunderstanding, has determined that it will not accept any challenge which Moscow decides, and it will pursue all issues, all ways, and advance slowly, 
and take the hits, whatever they come, but it will not uh, turn any situation into a litmus test as to whether Moscow is, is sincere with Armenia or not. It is understood that Moscow tries to destabilize, and it is understood that the government is doing everything not to allow Moscow any levers, any leverage in Armenia. The Communist Party of Armenia is really in a process of total disintegration. It represents very little power. It's not even able to be a decent opposition party, which would have been very nice because it would have had crystallized issues. There is no opposition party in Armenia, and that's one of the weaknesses of the parliament and the government. There are opponents, but on various issues. But the policy of the government has been such that when it's gone to the parliament and set and explained a policy, there has been an absolute majority of votes supporting the policies of the government, in most cases. The government's view of Armenia's future is that the strategy of Armenian liberation, of Armenian independence, in the past 300 years has been problematic, if not totally mistaken. That is, to rely on outside powers that could possibly come to either liberate you land, give you territory, or give you independence, has not worked and is not likely to work in the future particularly with the experience of Russia. After 150 years, Armenia has become smaller and smaller. And after Sovietization, if Soviet government was interested in giving Armenia anything, it would have given Garabagh and Nakhichevan and Afalkalak and all these places. The present policy and the future policy is likely for any power that is an imperial power to constantly keep trouble spots that it can manipulate any time into confrontation, uh, to, to force it into a confrontation stage, as be, uh, became Arapah between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And then Russia can become the big brother, saying these guys are tribal characters, they always kill each other. The government's policy, for example, is that if there was no imperial presence in Arapah today, that is, if there was no Soviet army with a specific political strategy of destabilization, Azerbaijan would realize that Armenia is powerful enough to resist any military attack. With the Garapah people, the way they're fighting now, and the commitment of Armenians in Armenia and the diaspora to help them, if there was a war today, Armenia would not be defeated by Azerbaijan. It would not be. Every time there has been a confrontation, military confrontation between Armenians and Azerbaijanis, Armenians have won. Where they have lost is Sumgait, when Azerbaijanis have decided to kill people, civilians, not the fighters. If there was no Soviet army in Garapakh today, Azerbaijan would realize that it cannot conquer Garapakh. And then it would come possibly to the same position where the Armenian government is today, <coughs> that that problem must be resolved through negotiations. That it was pushed as far as it could be pushed, but it cannot be won militarily. That the principle on which we function is the principle of self-determination, not territorial expansion. That's the difference between Garapal and Nakhichevan. You have the majority of the people who want to be with Armenia, then that's what we support in Armenia. We do not support the expansion of Armenia. This is an important distinction because it is also the problem of Western Armenian territories. The government of Armenia does not want to raise that question today, first because we do not have the means to resolve them. And demanding them and turning them again into a litmus test of nationalism or patriotism forces you into a corner where you cannot do anything else. Armenia has three and a half million people today that must survive. The policy of developing a strategy of survival and nationhood and state building on the basis of neighborly relations with your neighbors is not a denial of the importance of the genocide, but it is a recognition 
of the importance of the people of Armenia today. The genocide has taken enough victims. We do not need to martyrize another three and a half million to prove that we're patriotic. The government believes today that democracy is the cornerstone of state building. So that whatever a government decides, it is an elected government that has a mandate to make decisions to decide what is important today and what is not important. And what is important today is the ability of the Armenian people to elect their own government, to have an independent state, which does not oppose itself to Russia or Georgia or Azerbaijan or Iran or anyone but it is for itself. The Prime Minister said one day, the difference between Zori Balayan and the movement is that when the Azerbaijani team and the Armenian team are playing soccer, he said, Zori Balayan says, the Azerbaijani should be defeated. He says, we say Armenia should win. We are for ourselves, we're not <coughs> against anyone. What we want is the ability to develop, to set our own standards of democracy and human rights and political structures, and then see whatever it is that we need, economic development, viability, political security, then we go and negotiate. We know what we don't have. We are able to decide what is it that we're going to give up in order to get petroleum? What is it that we want to give up in order to have routes through Georgia or lease a port in on the Black Sea? or get truck routes to Turkey, or the bridge to Iran, or whatever. We decide because we are elected, and then we have the right to decide. The difference is the self-confidence that we are a nation, that we are capable of governing ourselves, we are capable of fully of defining our own national interests, to decide what among those national interests are vital, and for which we go to war, and for which we stay home and do our homework. Now a few words with regard to events in the past few weeks. You know that on March 17th, the Soviet Union uh, had a referendum, and the parliament of Armenia, I believe with the full support of all Armenians, decided not to participate in that referendum, with the uh, reasoning that the way the question was framed would clarify nothing. If, said the parliament, the purpose of the referendum is to decide whether there should be a union or not, then it is up to the republics and the nations of the union to decide whether to be in the union or not. And since that, that question would not clear it, Armenia would have its own referendum. And the parliament of Armenia decided that there will be a referendum that will ask very clearly the following question to the Armenians of Armenia or to citizens of Armenia. Do you agree that Armenia should be an independent and democratic state outside of the USSR? It's a very simple question. It also decided that the referendum will take place on September 21st. With the logic that every step that has been taken so far toward independence has been legal by USSR constitutional standards. The referendum that was taken by Gorbachev on March 17 had almost no constitutional basis. And it was irrelevant because it did not come from the constitutional requirements. The constitutional requirement says any republic that wants to secede must have a referendum. It also says the referendum must be six months after the decision for a referendum. And although there were tremendous pressures on the parliament, which continued after to, to have the, the uh, referendum earlier than six months, such as Georgia that did it last Sunday. The parliament of Armenia decided that in order to give more weight and less counter arguments to Moscow, it will follow the USSR constitutionally pres prescribed procedure and the referendum uh, will be in, on September 21st, which is six months and I think a couple of weeks after the decision for the referendum. The current polls indicate, and I've seen many polls, but this one was reliable, that if held today, the referendum would, would produce 75% yes to independence in Armenia. 
It may change higher or lower between now and September. But uh, that is the present informal, uh, unofficial uh, thinking. But it does not mean that even if it's 100%, yes, Armenia becomes independent on September 22. It just means that Armenian, the Armenian people have fulfilled their constitutional requirement in order to achieve independence. But that independence depends on, as I said, internal processes as well as the process of disintegration. It is very possible that there may be a civil war in the Soviet Union. The purpose of the government, the policy of the government today is to make sure that civil war does not spill over into Armenia. It has nothing to do with Armenia. That is, politically speaking, Armenia has decided where it stands. If there is a collapse of the Soviet Union, that means there is a collapse of the Soviet army, which means that the, uh, uh, the non-Armenians who are in Armenia have no reason to stay in Armenia in the army. They go, and you have the nucleus of an Armenian army that stays there, and Armenia is forced to become independent, whether it likes it or not, just as it had to in May 1918. So it is getting ready for that eventuality, where there may be a collapse of the Union, a collapse, a disintegration of the army, and then there is no one to claim Armenia except Armenia itself. So the government does not want to find itself in the same position of the National Council in Tbilisi in 1918. There is a government that's functioning, that's pushing in all directions, wherever there's an opening, without confrontation with Moscow or with its neighbors, pushing as much as it can to develop its own institutions or to take control of existing institutions, to adjust them to the new thinking. And therefore, the uh, process of becoming independent does not change much with the referendum, except you fulfilled one more requirement and you've taken the opinion of your people on a very, very critical issue. On this issue, for example, the referendum, this issue was one of the issues which Barur Harigan and his organization, Askaini Kamruman Niyavarum, I mean, self-determination unit or association, organization. Uh, on uh, last week or 10 days ago, there were three days of continuous demonstrations and uh, uh, confrontation. Uh, you know Baru Harigan very well. He has been the earliest dissident who has been imprisoned for, I think, at least four times for 17 years before uh, the change in government in Armenia. He was exiled, stayed in the States for a while, and went back uh, after the new government came and insisted that Moscow grant him back his citizenship because he was also elected to the parliament. Uh, Baruj uh, has been a very strong and sincere patriot. But eventually, he has gotten into a position which the government cannot support. Of course, there is no problem of him having any opinion or expressing any opinion in parliament or outside. There has been no censorship at all. Uh, in fact, that was the first question the president asked. He invited about 200 intellectuals three weeks ago into the presidium. And the president put them four or five questions. He said, you speak whatever you want, but I'd like to have the answer. One of the first was, do you feel any kind of censorship in your work as an artist, writer, editor, whatever? And there was no one who talked about any kind of censorship. So the, the question is not uh, one of uh, uh, opinion or, or uh, interpretation. The question is that at some point, Barur Harigan moved from having different opinions into acting upon his opinions, therefore becoming a government within a government, uh, started taking over buildings, and uh, mainly he started his organization and he were very active in encouraging the Armenian draftees not to go into the army. And uh, there was a confrontation in Girovagan where one of the draftees was taken in by the militia. His organization people surrounded the building and there was a confrontation. And Baru Harigan was finally taken to the militia station. The next day there was an extraordinary session of the parliament uh, where uh, the acting Minister of Interior, Ashokma Ashokmanacharyan, who the week before had been appointed National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister, uh, Ashok uh, decided to, with Vasken Sarksyan, who is the Chairman of the Defense Committee of the Parliament, they took him in for a few hours and uh, uh, also uh, his supporters came in, the, uh, the 
government. The militia decided that's a curfew violation because there's still a curfew from 12 to 5. So some of them were detained. And there was unpleasantness. Not the uh, he mainly stated that he does not think the government is on the right track. And if he doesn't think the government is on the right track, then he can, he's free to follow any policy he wants. And his organization is the real free Armenia, independent Armenia, and he can do what he want. Anyway, the parliament, the prime, the minister of interior demanded that uh, he be uh, he be penalized, but the parliament decided that he would be censored. And uh, they asked him to really. They tried to talk to him personally. I know I talked to him twice before, and I've talked to him since uh, those events. Uh, but there's a point beyond which it's very difficult to communicate with him. He wanted uh, the draftees to go into a national army. He wanted their for a referendum to take place on April 21st, not in September. He wanted direct presidential elections, and uh, he wanted an immediate declaration of independence. So uh, the government, uh, he has been talking about this, and there had been no trouble. But when he started acting and taking over buildings and uh, actively encouraging the Armenians not to go into the army, which would undo the agreements the government has with the Soviet army. Because if you don't supply the necessary soldiers, the Soviets can come and say the republic is not well defended, and etc. So uh, he's been quiet since then. Um, I don't know what will happen. Hopefully, he will think about the implications. Uh, I'm, I know that he's a very sincere fellow, and uh, he's got a good sense of humor, too. Uh, but it doesn't help uh, the fact that whatever you do now in a very, very new democracy, in a republic that has very solid relations with its neighbors and with the center, anything you do that tends to destabilize uh, has very, very serious consequences. And we know that Gorbachev can go either way. And uh, we know which direction he's going. And he's looking for good excuses to intervene and take over, particularly those republics that are democratic. That means the three Baltic republics, Moldavia, and Armenia. Georgia has a democratic gover ele democratically elected government, but it's very right-wing, very nationalistic. Nonetheless, these are the six republics that had free elections and elected democratic governments. And uh, the center wants to play around with that. And any kind of upheaval within the republic uh, is a good excuse uh, and a good lever for Moscow. In other republics, you're not uh, Gorbachev uses largely the ethnic minorities to destabilize. Armenia does not have ethnic minorities. And because the government has been able to put in perspective anything else that's happening, including Artsakh, then it, they have not been able to destabilize Armenia. Armenia is the most stable republic now in the Union, despite all the other problems. People are complain a lot against the Hersh, ANM, the government, but they know that the government is trying to do something. And this is the only government they have. A few days before I began, we had three days of demonstrations by the Tashna Kitun in Armenia uh, on the very specific issue of the March 16, 1921 treaty between Russia and Turkey. The Tashna Kitun demanding in demonstrations uh, that there be an extraordinary session of parliament and uh, that would declare that treaty null and void. Um, this was also the time where Ozal was in Moscow, dealing with Gorbachev. And um, there were slightly over one third of the members of parliament who had signed a petition uh, to uh, asking for the special session. And the presidium met on that issue, and the president was very adamant, so was the prime minister, that they don't want an extraordinary session. But if there is one third, the legal requirement, then there should be one. There was an informal session. I'm giving details so you know s how some of these things are decided. There was a, an informal uh, discussion at the Presidium. They invited all the members of Parliament in an informal meeting uh, to express their views on the subject. And the President spoke and others spoke. Uh, there were many arguments, including one by historian Rajik Simonian, that should Armenia declare the treaty void unilaterally, uh, Armenia may be in a state of war against Turkey by international law. I'm not sure that is the case, but that was one argument. Uh, others uh, explored uh, the uh, reasons why something like this was brought up. 
at this time and there were some serious charges made. Uh, at any rate, uh, the president uh, spoke as well and he, he suggested, he said that he was very much against uh, a session of parliament on this matter, that he would ask those who signed the petition to take back their signature so that there was no legal requirement. <coughs> But then if there's one-third uh, number of uh, signatories, then there would be a session. But he said it would be disastrous no matter what the parliament decided to bring up that issue at that time. He did favor a discussion of the larger issue of Armenia-Turkey relations. And he said that's what would make sense when you discuss the whole thing, not just one thing taken out of context and turned into a symbol. Uh, the March 21, March 16 treaty uh, became a symbol, and he was very much against the politics of symbols, and uh, so were many others. And uh, I think about 30 or 40 members of parliament took back their signatures, so the legal requirement for the uh, assembly of the parliament disappeared, and uh, there was the promise that the full issue would be discussed, and in fact, that's the first dossier uh, our department started preparing. The, Turkey Armenia relations issue. Uh, but that's uh, for three days, the, there were demonstrations. In fact, I think there were about two, three hundred people who came to our building, the Presidium building, and uh, slept in, on the steps. And uh, they had a good time, you know, singing and making speeches. Uh, very familiar with diaspora politics, and I was I felt very much at home. If I, can say that. I mean, not much strategy, but a lot of singing and a lot of good spirit. Um, the problem of uh, relations with the diaspora is one which is very difficult to touch because it's evolving uh, in a much more fluid manner than other things. Because on both sides, particularly after the earthquake there have been disappointments. We've had diaspora people who went to Armenia and uh, to, to do something, particularly businessmen, and felt very discouraged. We have charity groups that went in and are very discouraged and frustrated. And we have Armenians from Armenia who came to the diaspora uh, or who were promised things and never received it. So there has been mishandling of that very important dimension of Armenian politics on both sides and it's still not set. There are a number of steps that are being taken now, and that's also something uh, that's being prepared to see what are the real problems and how do, you, how do you resolve them, how do you create institutions and procedures by which uh, the diaspora can participate actively. I can tell you that there's some distrust in the government of Armenia with regard to diaspora organizations, particularly uh, the sense because of the sense that diaspora organizations have not supported the democratic movement and have not appreciated the democratic dimension of the changes in Armenia. That is, the question of Artsakh as a territorial expansion is better appreciated than the importance of democracy. And uh, then there's the second issue that, uh, that's something I, I think I believe in, and I've written about this and I've been criticized as some of you know, very, very harshly by various organizations for expressing those views with regard to diaspora organizations. I don't think diaspora organizations are still thinking in terms of stage building. I think it is the same values which we had in dealing with community organizations, which are now being transferred automatically without critical review to the building of an economy of a nation. And these are completely different qualitative uh, projects. So that uh, I think these things must be worked out very, very carefully, uh, very critically, in order to uh, not to lose the trust that exists. Armenia needs the diaspora, but it is uh, not clear as to how the diaspora and the government of Armenia and the people, the people are fine. I mean, that's easier one to one. But when it becomes a process of helping Armenia and helping the government and the process of nation building, I think there will have to be re-evaluation and serious examination on both parts. With regard to earthquake reconstruction, uh, many of you know have been there or have heard, heard report. Not much has happened. There's some building that's going on in Leninagan. Villages are a little better off, but there are very, very serious problems. 
because of the blockade that continues, the, the absence of raw materials, which is affecting not only the construction in, in, in the earthquake zone, but also the economy of the earthquake zone, as well as the economy elsewhere. Um, the, uh, the final point I would like to bring is that uh, the major issue gov the government set for itself the last few months was neither the March 16 treaty nor uh, independence immediately, but rather the very fundamental issue on the political level of the referendum, which was decided, three days of discussion in parliament, extremely high quality, extremely high quality, uh, as opposed to the discussions on Hyrigian, which sank to new laws. Uh, but uh, the, the more fundamental issue was that of land distribution. There's, there are, as you have heard, very serious shortages in Africa uh, of everything, in the Soviet Union as well. It's difficult to say we made it through the winter, and it's a great accomplishment. No famine, no major diseases, uh, even some transportation and heating occasionally. But it's not a situation that can continue. The spring uh, becomes easier, summer will be better because there will be some produce and stuff, but next winter can be totally disastrous. That's why the government thought that the primary responsibility is to make sure that the uh, rural areas of Armenia produce all the food they can for next winter. And that's why it was extremely uh, independent of, uh, of the uh, validity of arguments that came from the Tashnak soon on the treaty or the Barur Irigian group on independence tomorrow, the fundamental question was whether Armenia will have something to eat next year or not. And to take away from the attention which the government had to give to the issue of land reform, privatization of land, was uh, almost criminal in my view. Um, so the parliament debated for weeks the privatization law of land and passed the law a very elaborate law, uh, but uh, I'm not sure what the result will be. That is, we, we didn't have the statistics by the time I left as to how much of the land was in fact privatized. That is, the, the basic principle was that the, the members of a commune or the Sokhoz or a Golkhoz, the collective farms, could vote either to privatize the land of the village or to continue in that form. The old structures are very powerful in the rural area. The heads of the collective farms are very much the same as the old Communist Party structure. And whether the Communist Party continues to function or not, the rural area structure continues as an economic mafia. And the levers of, of pressure on individual peasants is very, are very great. So that uh, uh, most of the conservative vote came from the rural areas, just as it happened in Russia, for example, with regard to the referendum of March 17. Uh, you also had the same thing in Armenia. Those levers were used against land reform. That is, collective farm chiefs convinced their peasants, uh, their members, that it's, uh, the government is not serious. They're going to give it to you now, but they're going to take the land back. How are you going to till the land? You don't have equipment, etc., etc. When, in fact, the same tractor that was there, that you know, the number of the, the space is not increasing. It's the same land. You could share the tractor and do all of that if you wanted to. So there were many areas that voted, sometimes for very good reason, to keep the collective character of the farms in other areas under tremendous pressure. The government, ministers, uh, vice ministers, the prime minister, members of parliament were constantly in the villages, were traveling there, trying to explain to the peasants that this is serious reform. And this is not something on which the government can take any chances. And uh, we still, as I said, we still, I didn't have at least before I left last week, the results, uh, statistically speaking, as to what was the percentage and what kind of land was privatized, in fact, where was it that, that the peasant did take over. Uh, but it had to be done in March so that they do uh, the work in April and May, and then they have a harvest in the summer. Uh, we will see how uh, that works out. I went on longer than I wanted to. I uh, want to stop here uh, with one uh, small personal comment that um, 
I feel very privileged to have been trusted this job in, in Armenia. I have promised to be there for six months and have the, uh, this department established. The department will perform a perhaps triple function. One is, um, and I'm reporting something I'll be reporting, uh, they don't know yet. <laughs> I'll be reporting because I finalized it with the president just before I came. And uh, he asked me to report to the parliament directly when I get back. So they don't know what you know now. This is a first. That we will serve first as an information desk for any member of parliament on any day. And uh, secondly, we will work with, uh, with committees of parliament to either develop legislation, assess legislation, or provide research to any legislation to any of the committees. So it's not just foreign policy or whatever. And uh, thirdly, we will develop dossiers and basic information research and analysis on the major issues facing Armenia so that you have constant feedback and, and to the extent, fourthly, that you have uh, the parliament performing executive functions and particularly the president in charge of foreign policy, we will be doing the policy planning and the development of alternative options or strategies with regard to specific <coughs> issues, etc. Um, the department will have 15 full-time positions uh, with a lot of other support, none of them in fundraising, which is my salvation. Uh, that is, uh, when, when they first gave me the job, they were looking at me, they said 15 people and I didn't react. They repeated 15 full-time positions and I didn't react. And then uh, the, who was it? Uh, the vice president said, you sure that's enough? I said, look, if it's not enough and you know it, then give more. But 15 people? None of them in fundraising. <laughs> I have 15 people. I can choose. I can work wonders with 15 people. You know. um, but there will be all the experts with uh, uh, the uh, committees that will work with uh, this department. But I also did something else which is very important. Uh, just before I came, I'd hired already seven people. I have another seven. I interviewed 60 people. That you can write a book on those interviews. I mean, to know the job market in Armenia, to interview those people, it's fantastic. Anyway, just before I came, I uh, already selected the person who replaced me when the department is established. I didn't want to be in the same position as I was at the Zorian, where I wanted to leave, and the board would say, well, we don't have anyone to replace you. So I have someone already. Before we start operating, I know who's going to replace me. She's a brilliant uh, scientist, uh, astrophysicist, and it's going to be a first for a woman to be in charge of this kind of a department. Uh, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a troublemaker wherever I go. But I can tell you that um, uh, this job has been extremely confusing for me in a healthy way. I really don't know where I belong anymore. I feel quite comfortable. I know that this is home. But uh, I can't say that's not home. I, uh, I work with people. Uh, it's good to be able to work on something, you know, uh, may make a difference in a real way. Uh, I know that I will not have this job uh, once it's established. Uh, it will be operational 40% by the end of the month and 80% by July. Uh, what happens after that, it's very difficult to say because there are so many factors. Uh, there are already other possibilities, but uh, that's not something that can be discussed now because there are many, many factors involved. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, I have to go like this to say, this is really you walking the streets of Yerevan, having a job and a job in the government. I mean, for a historian, instead of writing, uh, being there, uh, sometimes I have double vision. My office is next to the vice president and the president is there. And I walk by and I feel like sitting and just watching, you know, just taking notes as a historian instead of going into policy planning and strategies and options and all of that. But then I tell you, when I started writing again, I'm writing very, very differently than I did before. Uh, history will not be the same. And uh, for that, I can only thank democracy. Uh, hopefully there will be more of it and um, many more will have this opportunity to, uh, to serve in a, in a different way. I'll be happy to answer any questions.
Thank you, uh, Gerard. I'm sure that uh, all of you found uh, what he had to say thought-provoking and informative. And uh, this is your opportunity to ask questions, and if you have a counter view, uh, just keep it brief. One <coughs> other request that I have to make is that uh, whether you ask a question or you have an opinion, please speak up loud enough so the tape recorder can catch it. Now that there is a political government there, do you have a model for which this new Armenian independent government is made? Like taking Switzerland or a small government like Belgium or Poland? Do you have a model? Second, how effective is the parliament in legislatures and enforcing the legislature? And how effective is the executive branch of the government? Another question. What is the relation of the Soviet army in Armenia and the Armenian army in Armenia? And fourth, what's the relation with our Turkey? <laughs> Very quickly, uh, they, they are working on the Constitution. And uh, now there are some elements that are there, but there's a comparative dimension that's being developed and we're working on. But I think if there is any single model, it would be France rather than any of the others, because it's closer. Uh, it's a single homogeneous group, departments, rayons, or regions, etc. So uh, it's, it's more likely to be uh, the French model. With regard to the effectiveness of the parliament, it's uneven. That is, some of the legislation is very good, arrived at very uh, easily, and others are very torturous. And some of the legislation, uh, for example, on political parties, uh, it was voted on and sent to the prime minister so that he implements it. The prime minister looked at it and sent it back, begging the parliament to review it because there were parts that were inconsistent. So it's, it's not even. With regard to the executive, it's even, I think, uh, more uneven and perhaps even less effective uh, because it's been more difficult to change the ministries and the cadres and the personnel of the ministries than the parliament. As a general uh, answer, I think that's what I can say. Relations between the Armenian army and the Soviet army don't exist, except that the, there is no Armenian army. There's the National Guard type thing, about a thousand people who are trained and armed, and they're very separate from anything else. Uh, they're, they are loyal to the parliament, directly to the parliament, and therefore, they're mainly under the uh, command of Vasken Sarxian, the chairman of the uh, parliament's uh, armed forces committee or something like that. But Vasken is also the person who's in charge of the defense, in fact, of the borders. Therefore, he and the president and the prime minister deal with the Soviet army. Relations are cordial, uh, but not very friendly. Uh, they try to keep it correct, non-confrontational. You don't see the army in the streets. That's very clear. They've kept the army out, and they intend to keep them out. With regard to Turkey, I think other than the statements that were made, the, the positions that were taken by the government in a number of ways, first in the Declaration on Independence, where uh, the genocide issue was brought in after a long debate, but no question, no specific demand of territory, which is different than, let's say, the political parties we have here. So that was noted by the Turkish government. Then other statements made by the president and ministers, etc., that we want to have good relations with uh, all our neighbors, including Turkey. Uh, there have been some contacts. Uh, there have been uh, that the president, the chairman of the uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, friend of Harris, per se, uh, went to Turkey uh, as, uh, as a member of the delegation from the Soviet Union. The uh, deputy foreign minister went to Turkey, the deputy foreign minister of Armenia, as part of a delegation uh, that went from the Soviet Union to listen to what President Ozan had to say <coughs> with regard to the Black Sea Consortium he wants to create, of which Armenia is supposed to be part. And I know that he was really bombarded with questions on Armenia-Turkish relations, and he was not authorized to speak, and he did not speak on that subject. I know that the Minister for External Economic Affairs, Yesai Stepanyan, went to Turkey in another delegation, and he had some discussions. 
none of them dealing directly with the issue of Armenia-Turkey relations. That has not come up yet. But there have been statements, there, has been, there have been responses from Turkey, Gozal saying there's a new government, there's new thinking which deserves to be studied, etc. On the practical step, it has not meant much, uh, except that Turkey now allows trucks to come to Armenia from Europe, which is very important because some of the uh, uh, milk powder came uh, through that, and that's the most effective way. Uh, that's the route from uh, Istanbul, Ankara, uh, Sepastia, Erzingan, Erzurumgars to Leningrad. So that was used, uh, that's being used on occasion with no trouble. And in fact, it's turning out to be a safer route than Georgia or Azerbaijan, where uh, stuff is being looted and stolen by local people. Stuff destined to Armenia. Uh, but the ones coming from Turkey are coming through all right. I think uh, what there may be some development later when the parliament takes up the issue and discusses it in substance. And that is always a process of education to the public as well. And then something else may happen. There are no Fedayans. Some of them have been, uh, have gone back to work or to their villages or towns. Some are part of the army. And a few of them who were really the troublemakers are in prison. With the uh, With regard to the uh, taxation, yes, there is taxation. Most of the system of taxation is the general Soviet taxation. Uh, so that the government collects and then sends, sends it to Moscow. And then Moscow sends some of it back to specific institutions. I was, for example, surprised to hear that the Academy of Sciences was financed always directly from Moscow, the Academy of Sciences of the USSR. Uh, and there are many institutions like that. And the USSR Academy of Sciences told the Armenian Academy of Sciences that we may not have money for you next year. So the Armenian Academy of Sciences went to the Prime Minister asking for money. The Prime Minister said, you reform yourself, first of all. <laughs> Become efficient. <coughs> they got some 10,000 workers, most of them called research researchers, and they do nothing. So it, you have to have efficiency, etc., etc. So there was a confrontation between the two, and the Academy of Sciences is the, one of the most reactionary places in Armenia. Um, the university uh, went to the prime minister asking for money. Then the prime minister said, look, uh, you have to change your head. And the president of the university resigned. Uh, <laughs> and they got someone who's more efficient. So uh, these institutions are often tied uh, to both republic government and USSR. And all of that is really very, very confusing, and it takes a lot of time. The government functions on deficit, so uh, it has not levied new taxes, but it is keeping more of what, is, what it is levying. Uh, but uh, Moscow is not helping at all, obviously. Whether it will be a model to the others. Armenia looks very carefully at what happens, not in Georgia, nothing democratic happens in Georgia. Uh, Azerbaijan is certainly finished off for the time being, yes, and, uh, decent society, 80% communist vote is uh, too much to swallow, but uh, the Baltic states and Moldavia, and uh, they follow what happens in Armenia. Uh, in fact, there are always three, four different groups who are in the Baltic states studying this or that aspect, and then they come. Now they've started coming, uh, and I think particularly now there's quite a bit of interest in the department that I'm developing. But, uh, uh, it's, they learn from each other. They always look at each other to see what did you do, because it's one thing to look at France. But France can only provide so much information and, uh, and uh, enlightenment with regard to an issue, because you start with something else. But the Baltic states are more like Armenia in terms of the system you start with. So any experimentation there will serve better here. But uh, for example, in the Baltic states, I know in, in, in this case again, uh, there are some, some advisors 
who were invited from America to, to help the Baltic states, Lithuanians, Latvians, etc. Uh, but Armenia is the only one in the Soviet Union, and I think I'm the only one so far that has invited an outsider to be an official of the government. Now they're starting to look at it, and I've been asked a number of questions as to what happens to my citizenship and, you know, uh, and whether I get into trouble or not. And uh, uh, so far, uh, I think that's an important experiment that's taking place. Of course, the Russians are interested too, not just the Latvians. I'd like to uh, commend you for the position you take in and will contradict you. I think when you first started out, you said you were a pessimist. I'm going to say you're the perennial Armenian optimist, which, I mean, an Armenian has to be an optimist. You didn't ask me whether it will succeed or not, and I didn't tell you. Uh, well, I, it must, it's I going to you. Because, we, because the Armenian will also, always say, we serve a love a sink, we love a lot. So there's always positive thinking amongst the Armenian. Uh, and the, just to be sure that uh, my comments aren't taken that I'm uh, to the fact that I'm denigrating the Armenian people because I feel that they are of the same genetic makeup as we are here. But because of the type of government we have here, people here have blossomed, but people over there are, are in a low third world position. So I don't think we can say enough as how badly the system over there stinks. And the other situation in terms of the uh, privatization uh, of the land, when I visited over there, and I would rub it in because I knew the answer, but we'd go by the vineyards, and there'd be this little portion of the vineyard where the plants were just beautiful. There wasn't a weed, and they were just loaded with <coughs> grapes. And immediately adjacent to it, the plants were withered. The, it was full of weeds. And I'd ask, why is the difference? It's the same land. Well, that's his little private plot. So why isn't the peasant, uh, you know, it's right there before his eyes, why right? doesn't he look to reason and see that with the uh, privatization of the land, they can do so much better? Well, uh, I answered the first comment you made. Uh, uh, I can only add that uh, I really don't need to believe that it will succeed in order to try. And uh, that's a very healthy position to have. Um, secondly, with regard to uh, the privatization, not all villages and rural areas are like the plain of Ararat. So if you went to villages in Ararat, the plain of Ararat, Ararat Yantash, these are wealthy villages, these are well-to-do, it's fertile land, etc., etc. But not if you go to the mountains, not if you go to the south, to Goris, to Zangezur, etc., mm -hmm. some of them absolutely Amasya. You know, those are, that's different land, different soil, different economy, it's not as, they don't have it as good as they have it in, in uh, Bogdan Perian or Echmiadzi, etc. Um, with regard to the blossoming of the people, I'm not sure I understand you. If you mean that we have blossomed intellectually, culturally, etc., or do you mean economically we have well, blossomed? Well, I think in all spheres. Yeah. Well, I've found uh, that uh, in terms of the economy, obviously, uh, it's true, but I think there is a tremendous amount of uh, spirit of initiative, and people are now that people no, no longer expect miracles, either from democracy in and by itself, or the diaspora, or America, or Gorbachev, uh, more and more people are taking on themselves the task of finding ways of making money and prospering economically. Uh, culturally, I don't know. It's very difficult to assess. To some extent, it's very subjective, uh, particularly as to what I think of the culture that we have created or we have partaken in. Uh, but uh, I can say that I have been pleasantly surprised after very serious disappointments and frustrations in the first place when I was looking for a few analysts and I had a series of people who came and I interviewed them I mean, what they thought analysis was, political analysis, and what I thought of, what I knew it was, was horrendous, and it was extremely depressing. Uh, and then I thought, and I said, I'm not going to look where I should look, I have looked, I'm going to look where I should not look. I said, where is it that uh, the mind 
may have not been corrupted. And I looked at the people who are in government. The president is a classicist, student of Assyrian and Greek and Latin. Last week, he took four, we four hours off to complete his uh, editing of a section of the Old Bible for translating it from modern Armenian. It's a larger project. Uh, he used to be a senior researcher at the Modern Opera, right? The Prime Minister is a mathematician. The first Vice President is a mathematician. Uh, the, uh, and you go down the line there. Mathematicians, ancient history people, only one, Gidrit Sartarian, who's now Deputy Prime Minister, is a historian of the modern period. And uh, you go down the line, and I called some scientists. And uh, one Edmond Avedian, who's, who was in jail, and many people don't know about him, he's a brilliant linguist. Uh, he was probably the one who suffered much more than Barud or anyone. He's out now. I knew that I'd worked on his case as a human rights case many years ago. I found his number and I called him. I said, you don't know me. I need people. He said, who? I said, I don't care. Anyone who's smart. You know, I am not meeting smart people. And he sent me four. And I hired two of those. And I realized that um, the thinking process has remained much healthier and in some ways much more sophisticated than people I've met here. I have not met many Armenians who are political analysts or strategists. I have not met many Armenians who can think free politically, despite the fact that we are in America or in France. I think we can think free when we're thinking of American politics, but we have not had the intellectual freedom and political imagination to free ourselves from the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. We think if we break through, there's nothing left there to be Armenian about. It's either that or the genocide. The assassination of the bishop or the genocide, right? Either one, you can take your pick. It's not healthy, is it? And I don't know of many Armenians who have been able to, to really overcome those problems. But I see in Armenia the kind of thinking that is unbelievable, except you shouldn't go to the historians. You shouldn't go to the social scientists. You shouldn't go to those who call themselves political scientists or sociologists or whatever. They're stuck. It's very difficult for them to get out of the system, thinking-wise. They're not communists or whatever, but there's a thinking process. And when I first studied the question as to what to do with this department and what the difficulties would be, I gave an interview to television, and then the president wanted to hear. He said, what is it that you need now? And I said, look, I thought the problem would be computers, but we can buy them, steal them, or whatever, right? I thought the problem would be space. You've given me all the space. I thought the problem would be people. I said, we even found smart people. But I said, I don't know how to break through the kind of thinking that is so endemic. That is, you know how Marxism-Leninism works, right? It's a formula for understanding and therefore solving problems. And it's the kind of thing where you say, what is the problem? This is the formula. This is the answer, right? And the solution, the interpretation and the solution. Not only they're there, but they're the only ones that can exist. There's uncertainty that is so comforting in Marxist Leninism, which also invites you to sit on the margins and look at politics and history as a spectator sport. Now, they don't have to be Marxist Leninists, but there are three, four other things that have replaced it. One is prediction, political prediction. Now, how do you do prediction? One is the mathematical models. You create the model, then you put any problem and you pick out the answer. There is an answer, that is the only answer, and it's a perfect answer. It's decided. Others do uh, game theories, right? I mean, they're more advanced than we are. They have game theories. They are specialists of this. And they know that there's an answer, the answer will come out, and whatever it is, is perfect. So that you're almost detached from the problem before you get into it. The third is probably the most scientific, Kavat <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one is as good as the other as far as I'm concerned. So I, I told the president, my main problem is, how do I make these people feel uncomfortable in uncertainty? That is, you go and you look at the problem and say, there's a problem, and I don't know what it is, and I don't know what the solution is, and I don't know what the response will be. That's the only way you can feel free to explore all the possibilities. So I told them, uncertainty is very good. 
You don't need to predict. Please don't predict. Just say that you are participating in the making of something. And I've started experimenting with the analysts I've chosen. It works wonders when you tackle this problem. That is the main problem. It is not a question of economic prosperity, cultural value, or whatever, whatever. It's a problem of getting out of the system where people are not healthy, they don't feel good, unless they know that whatever the problem, there's absolutely a solution, and this is the way you solve it. So you detach, you don't have to put in anything. You can sit and praise the government, idealize it or criticize it, but whatever will be, will be, you know? And so, who needs to think? <laughs> Take a question. Uh, I'm not sure how to ask this question, but I'm very concerned about your comment that the government there feels that the diaspora has not been supportive of the democratic uh, approach that they've taken. On the other hand, I'm not surprised because I think we, we have a very different future. We identify with Armenia in different ways, but we are not bound to Armenia. Our future is not bound to Armenia. And we sort of impose on it what we want. Mm -hmm. makes us feel good. Uh, but it does worry me that uh, this may lead to a break of some kind of a relationship that we always presume or took for granted. Um, I think you're in a unique position to comment on, on that. I don't know that our future is the same as Armenia's future. And I don't know that we have anything to do with to say about Armenia's future, not, not being bound up in it. Um, and as you can inferred, I think we are not very democratic here. We don't function as a community very democratically. And we live in a system that doesn't function very democratically. We just, you know, repeat the rhetoric of it. So I worry more about the loss of connection that this might mean if Armenia, in fact, flourishes and we just get left to be the outside supplier of money or the driver of emotional comfort. Or yeah. Well, it's feasible, but I don't think it will happen. Uh, what will happen is that the relationship between the diaspora and the, the uh, republic will not be the way it started two years ago. That is, everything going to organizations and government. First of all, there's tremendous people-to-people -people, uh, relations, uh, relations. And secondly, I think there are new structures that are being born that will both complement what exists and force the existing organizations into a, a more uh, comprehensive and participatory kind of thing. Whether that will impact diaspora in general politics, I don't know. But there is no doubt that the existing policy of the organizations to transpose whatever structures they have, whatever value systems and decision-making processes they have, with regard to local institutions, community structures, to transpose all of that automatically, without critical review, without analysis, to relations with Armenia and state building has harmed more than help. It doesn't mean building a school doesn't help. It just means that it has not brought the full array of relations and communication that could have been possible. And to the extent that organizations have been too rigid and too slow to respond to the new needs, then others are born. Other groups, and we can look around in your papers and see all the small groups that are born that, have, that didn't exist two years ago. At the same time, I think Armenian organizations, the major ones, are now realizing that the policy of continuing a legitimacy on the basis of helping Armenia, but largely with the view of uh, continuing their own internal structures here, it will not work. I think they're realizing that. I've seen in the last two months, for example, substantial differences, relatively speaking in the position of the Ramgavar party, in the position of, uh, you know, to some extent, even the Tash uh, and the uh, AGBU, etc. I think I have started feeling that in the last month or two. Uh, perhaps it started earlier and it's coming out now, but I feel that they know that this government will do whatever it can to survive, and it knows that it, the diaspora can give much more than it has given, not in terms of money, there's much more than this diaspora can give than money. Much more. Like, for example, all the experts we have in so many different fields who can go and, with much less cultural barriers, help uh, people there, help institutions, as long as you allow yourself to be just an advisor and not a decision maker. 
That is, if you go and say, this is wrong, this is, this is how we do it in America, no one will listen to you. They're very polite, they'll give you your cognac and send you back. <laughs> <laughs> and you think you're worshipped, you know? They're very good at it. But uh, you will not help. You have to realize they have to do it their way. But if you're there, you can say, look, if you do this, this may happen. That's it. If you do that. Accountants, uh, administrators, managers, technicians, scientists, all of that. That's one. Secondly, the political, the international political presence of Armenia, whether now, before there are ambassadors of Armenia, or after there are ambassadors of Armenia, it is very important that we coordinate our politics, international politics, with the politics of Armenia. doesn't mean we agree always. It does mean that we follow orders that should never happen, but that we have a regular communication where what we do does not harm our means. And some of that is happening now. Would you, would you uh, recommend a peace court type thing? <laughs> yes, I would recommend. I, I know that there's a, no, there's a proposal from here that's gone to Armenia, but I'm not sure that at the present time Armenia has the structures to accept and efficiently use that project or that kind of project. It may come in a few months. There, there's very serious work being done to come to terms with the question of how to integrate rationally, efficiently, the help that is coming from, our, uh, from the diaspora. That has not happened yet. So I would not want it to be like many of the businesses that have been started and are going nowhere. I would recommend that discussions be held, that the project be developed, because eventually it will be very useful. Uh, it is useful now, but unless there are structures that can accept it, it's going to be very difficult for that kind of thing to be a peace corps. There are smaller projects that are working, and you can start very small, in fact. But even that, in order for it to be effective, there has to be some crystallization in the thinking of the government. Here. Most of the schools are closed. Most of the Russian schools are closed. Schools are, I'm sorry? Um, the, no, 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 Russian departments aren't closed, but much more of the teaching is in Armenian, is in Armenianization, let's say. Second question is, uh, what about the success rate of joint ventures, that is, Armenian joint ventures uh, being founded? I think after a uh, period of uh, increase, now it's leveled. Uh, the ones that are there, I think there's only one or two that are in fact doing what they were supposed to do. Most of them have become import-export type of things, and even that I'm not sure is functioning. Uh, the main problem is that joint venture law, although Armenia has the right to approve joint ventures, but still your finances, your banking and everything is tied to Moscow, and people don't know what laws apply today as opposed to tomorrow, and so there's uncertainty which businessmen cannot take. At this point, it's slowed down. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I'm not sure, well, some may be going through Leninagan, but there's a lot more be, uh, that are uh, groups that go to Istanbul. But in most cases, it is groups of individuals who go and buy things they for themselves cheaper than they can buy, and then sell some of it back on the black market and make some money. <laughs> It's uh, you go through Georgia to Batumi or uh, take the boat to Istanbul. And then the last question is: Do you call about Britain? Because you have to do a study. You know, you have to do a Well, I think he's right to the extent that the military and Gorbachev would not allow. But military and Gorbachev could themselves disintegrate. That's likely to happen. Yes, sir. Uh, today's news indicating that Boris Yeltsin has been given extraordinary powers by the Russian Federation. Um, how would that affect the first, the military aspects of Armenia, and secondly, the democratic processes? 
Well, it would not affect immediately the military situation of Armenia or its defenses. Uh, the Yeltsin-Gorbachev battle, to the extent that it affects us, relates at this point to two things. First, Karabakh. That is, if Yeltsin was in charge, I'm sure he would withdraw the Soviet army from there, which would be to our advantage. That's all we want at this point. Soviet army out will be all right in Karabakh. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the process of disintegration of the empire, whether it takes place peacefully or in bloodshed, depends on whether it's Yeltsin or someone like him or Gorbachev. So if it's uh, Yeltsin, then uh, I think he will let the Baltics go. He will let the uh, Caucasian, Trans-Caucasian Republics go. He will hold on to some extent to U Ukraine as a federation, some kind of an agreement. And then the Central Asian Republics like to stay where they are at this point, and they stay in the Union. Uh, Gorbachev will not uh, allow it, but Gorbachev is also known uh, uh, as uh, someone who wants to survive. And uh, if, it, if he has to face the choice between being the president of a Soviet Union that does not include the Caucasian republics or the Baltics, as opposed to not having anything at all, he will probably accept the first. He's a pragmatist. Yes? Uh, a comment and a, and a double question. I'm, I'm uh, pleased to hear you say that the uh, present government is adopting a non confrontational stance. That speaks very well for the possibility of this staying alive. Uh, my question is, you mentioned during your presentation that there is no opposition party. Uh, is the uh, opposition at a grassroots level so minimal that people are not even aware of it? Is the, is the government, uh, uh, would you say, essentially... Uh, no. The, I, there may be, I don't know, if there's a vote tomorrow, it may be that uh, the, the ANM may not take, get the majority I'm of the I'm curious to know what the opposition consists of. I mean, well, kind of yeah, the, the problem with the absence of an opposition, it's not that there are people, there are not people who disagree with the government on this or that issue, but there that is no group that has developed a coherent approach to the larger set of problems that is in opposition to what the government is now proposing. Mm -hmm. Because this government came into power as a movement, and as a movement that was capable of absorbing a lot of the issues and finding middle of the road realistic solutions so whatever problems are faced by the republic are encompassed in the program of the government number one therefore an opposition that could come and say that's not the problem this is the problem that doesn't exist secondly to the extent that the government may have had an extreme position in one so a clear opposition is uh, emerge emerges someplace saying no we don't want that we want this that's that hasn't happened and although there are areas where this group opposes the government on that particular issue, and that group on another issue. There is no set of issues on which one single group says, of the ten major issues, there are five where I disagree, and therefore I'm your opposition now. That has not happened. Uh, for example, the major issues of draft, <coughs> of independence, of uh, land reform, privatization, etc., the government's position seems to be realistic and middle of the road. So it's, it's attacked, for example, on the right, you may say, on one right, which is Heidegger, saying independence tomorrow. It is attacked by others who say no independence. And the public in general cannot take no independence. But they also know they cannot have it tomorrow. So the government's position is very solid on it. It's very on very solid ground. Therefore, when they go to the parliament, although there are, I don't know, 16, 17 political groups, seven, eight political parties, um, none of them have anything to say that is substantially different than what the government says. Therefore, when it votes, let's say, on the referendum, whether to participate in the Soviet referendum, uh, I think uh, 182 said no, two abstained, two said yes. When it came as to what is the wording of the referendum in Armenia, the same vote, approximately. The only disagreement was major disagreement whether to do it in April or May or in September. And then it was something like it took a second vote to have a majority in September. But even then, it wasn't Hersher versus others. People in Hersher, some of them in ANM, the national movement, uh, were against the recommendation of the president so or the prime minister. part of my question is that during your presentation also, when you were mentioning the different divisions of the government, 
sort of quickly slid over PR. And I'm, yeah. cur I'm curious to know what the role of the press is yeah. in the present. Well, I should have used the information office. It's not uh, PR. It should be PR, but there is no PR. What, what the presidium the has, has a, uh, an office uh, manned by one voluntary director who is a member of parliament and three people, uh, three workers who write press releases on what's happening in the presidium or the parliament. That's as far as it goes. The press, the parliament has a newspaper, a daily newspaper called the Hayastani Hara uh, which is also in Russian. Uh, the, uh, it is not very clear as to what its purpose is. Sometimes it acts as if it's the congressional record, says this is what the parliament did, etc. On other occasions it's got uh, the full text of the laws. On other occasions it's got news and it's not very even. It's improving now a little bit. But there is a flourishing press. On the one hand we know that there's no paper in Armenia. On the other hand every week there's a new newspaper. A new week. At the present time you have the Armenian national movement that has a weekly called Hype. Uh, uh, different political groups have their own weeklies. There is uh, the parliament's paper, Hayastani Hara Vedutu, a daily. There is uh, Yeregoyan Yerevan, which is the liveliest of the old papers uh, that comes out. Now it's an independent paper. The uh, Ramgavar party has started a newspaper called Ask. It comes out twice, and it's probably the best. Uh, it has quite a bit of international news in the way we understand it the way they don't have it over there. So it's, uh, the looks can be improved, but I think they'll do it. But it's, it's, it sells very well, people read it, and it's probably the best thought out newspaper. It has very little and very indirect PR for the Ramblers, <coughs> but quite a bit of news, very informational. The Tashnak Student has a paper that's called Azadamar that started recently, it's a weekly, but it seems to be largely PR oriented toward the party. The um, Various other groups have uh, papers. The uh, and local Hinchagians have a paper. Uh, it is extremely varied, yes. It's extremely varied. Do you have a question at the table? Yes, at the table, yes. Uh, uh, this one. You have, we have grown up with inspirations of the educational progress in Armenia. And uh, I'm very much concerned with all the progress in education that we have heard about in the past 40, 50 years, is the uni are the universities and other institutions contributing to the government's progress? Well, I think one would have to be very, very careful in, uh, in characterizing educational progress. That is, uh, if if uh, you're referring to the same things I've read during the past, uh, if not 40 years, I'm about five years younger than you are. <laughs> you know, uh, if you are referring to the same numbers, then we're talking about numbers. So many graduates from this institute, so many from that university, etc. There is very little with regard to quality of education that uh, could be bragged about. Uh, the quality of education is very low. We had very outstanding professors who came here. Yes. Charles Sikian, and if you're yes. familiar with him. Individual, yes. I'm not talking about individual geniuses, individual talents. I'm talking about the larger quality of people, whether it's in medicine or whatever. Some of the sciences, some mathematics, etc. Some branches have been very good, but the rest of it has not been very good. Uh, uh, I think, in general, that has not been there. Whether they're contributing, uh, yes, but so far, it hasn't gotten to the point where it will make much of a difference because the government did have already a lot of the of these people involved. The government and the university, the government and the Academy of Sciences uh, have always been quite integrated. Um, there has been some talk, at least perception, of intellectuals not supporting the government and the government not um, not uh, being close to the intellectuals, which is strange because this is a government of intellectuals. Uh, but uh, the, uh, there was a meeting again uh, of, uh, at the presidium. The president invited about 200 intellectuals from all walks of life to the presidium and said, this is your forum, tell me what you think. Criticize us, tell us what's wrong, etc., etc. And unfortunately what came out was 
the chair, the president or vice president of the Academy of Science says you're not giving us enough money. The president of the university compa complains says you're not giving us enough money. And each one complained about the little things rather than presenting a larger critique of the government. There is uh, what is known as the intelligentsia in Armenia is often that which collaborated with the previous regimes in, and the government does not care that much about uh, necessarily catering to them. But there is a, another intelligentsia that was with the movement in a different way that has stayed away to some extent. Have many of them immigrated to uh, Moscow or anything like no. that? No, there is no immigration to Moscow. There is Armenian immigration. Yes, there is immigration from Moscow. There are many Armenians who were living in Moscow have come now to Yerevan, and are becoming very active. That has started. Yeah. I met about five of them uh, in the last month, in fact, uh, very yeah. highly placed. Now, to go to the other extreme, we knew during the uh, severe period that Armenians used to come from Beirut with gold into Yerevan. And they were even stopped on the way. Now, if they hadn't bribed the customs, if they could do it, then isn't they shouldn't have been in the business to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> but Armenians have always found a means uh -huh. of doing business. Right. Whatever it is. They're still doing business. <laughs> Much more than before. <laughs> what happened to the fifty hundred dollar ruble bills? You want to know? Yeah. There's, well, they, when the government decreed that uh, you have to turn in everything you have, and you're allowed only a thousand rubles, right? Legally, beyond that, you really have to explain why you have a hundred thousand rubles on a salary of two hundred fifty rubles a month, <laughs> and uh, you had to do it at the committees in the factories or in your institutions, etc. So after one day of research, the government checked with the Baltics what they were doing. I mean, all the republics talked to each other. And then uh, the prime minister went on television, Vasquez Manugian, and said, fellow citizens, you know the order. This is the order. It says, in addition to being totally immoral, this will not help anyone. Uh, but central authorities have this control over the, the army and the money. Now they're using. They've used the army. Now they're using the money says, if we decide not to do this, it's going to harm us more. Uh, even though we don't like it, we're going to do it. Now, it? we're going to do it in such a way uh, that even the last of our thieves will get their 100 rubles changed to 25 rubles. <laughs> it says, because they are our thieves, this is our capital, and we'll keep it in the republic. Now, please don't panic. Do the following things. Follow the rules, but make sure everyone changes the money. And they changed everything. <laughs> the major beneficiary, some people lost money, uh, a million here, two million there, but these were the people. <laughs> but these were the people whose main capital was in gold, right? It wasn't in rubles. Ruble was just the exchange in, you know, under the mattress. One fellow called uh, Fajik Stambolsian, you know him, He's the founder of Kututun, charity group. He's also a member of the parliament, chairman of the earthquake zone and refugees. Uh, he's a kind of uh, spiritual leader. He's the real Gatoigos in Armenia. <laughs> and Khachik uh, uh, Stambolsian is a bearded fellow. And Khachik got a call from this fellow and said, look, I really changed all I needed. I don't care about this money. I got an extra 800,000. Uh, why don't I give it to you? to Kututun, and you, you're an agency, you can't change it. So Hajik took 800,000 rubles in, changed it to 25 rubles legally, and then asked the television uh, announcer, the news announcer, after the evening news, the announcer went on television and says, fellow citizen, those of you who have difficulty changing your large amounts, <laughs> you can think about donating it to Kututun or any other. <laughs> and they did it. <laughs> I mean, it became a family business for three, four days. People had nothing, could do nothing else but to go but and change, stayed. and change, and change them, and everyone changed, and no one lost money, and it and remained. It stayed within the country. It stayed within the country. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> two, two questions and a comment. Uh, when you were uh, commenting on disintegration of the, of the empire. Uh, you said that uh, a civil war or civil wars might be coming. Could you be more specific and define what are some of the triggers that might set it off 
and also what will be some of the engines that will drive those civil wars? The first question. Second question, uh, between uh, Armenia and the Baltic states, how can the economic ties be intensified? Because there's certain things that are available in the Baltic states, there's certain things that are available uh, in Armenia, grapes, for example, you know, one. And how, how those ties could be intensified? And for the comment, uh, last week, uh, departing Lithuania, I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with, with Professor Landsberg, who is the uh, president of the parliament. And he asked about what kind of minorities existed uh, in the Boston area. And knowing Harry, I said, well, there's a strong Armenian. And he says, well, terrific. He said, when you go back, if you ever have a chance to be with a group of Armenians to, to, to send my greetings to them, and second is to thank them for what they are doing to help their brothers and sisters in Armenia, uh, because he values uh, uh, all the help that, that he can get from here, and obviously uh, he wants to, to see the Armenian brothers that are there. And as you know, some of the Lithuanian work uh, brigades were there during the uh, during the uh, uh, earthquake or post uh, uh, earthquake period, and uh, some of them I talked to, and they ran out of materials and they came back. Well, they were one of the first to to begin with the last comment. They, the Lithuanians were one of the first to come into Armenia, and I know uh, when we went there. In January of '89, we went and talked to them. They they were the first to start working on the compound. Uh, Armenia and uh, Lithuania, of course, have uh, have developed closer ties because both have had movements, both have been democratic. But also, when uh, <coughs> last January, uh, Soviet army moved into uh, Vilnius, uh, it was uh, the president of Armenia who was going to a Federation Council meeting of Moscow uh, with his uh, then uh, friend Ashad Manucharyan, who came up with the idea of using the Federation Council to stop the bloodshed. And as you know, uh, they forced that on Gorbachev. The Federation Council got their Vedrosian, plus they also put Moldavia's president to go to Vilnius. And uh, I know some of the details of the discussions where the president of Armenia and Ashad Manucharyan were quite instrumental in stopping the advance of the Soviet army uh, by calling on Gorbachev and saying, uh, and the commander, of the local commander, apparently there was a confrontation <coughs> with their Bedrosia, and he said, as far as I know, Soviet constitution says only the local government or the president of its union can order the army to move. Where is your order? And if you don't have it, you don't have it. Called on Gorbachev, says, if you have you given an order, and called on the Landsbergis and so, but I also know that uh, the Petrosian advised the Lithuanian government uh, to not to adopt a confrontational style because that would only bring in more of the army and to work at it in a, in a different way. Economically, they, uh, if there, there's freedom of movement of capital, I think it will be much more useful. Transportation-wise, it's difficult. I know that a lot of Armenians study in Lithuania or the Baltic states and they feel much more comfortable there than they do in many of the republics where they often have to go. But I, I don't know that it will be difficult to have intense uh, economic relations at this point due to transportation problems. But culture and political, I think, they will be very, very close, and they were close to, I know, in terms of Soviet politics. They consult always, and even if they don't adopt the same policy, they tell each other the three republics and Armenia who's going to do what, what position, so that wherever they can, they coordinate. So that, I know, happens. With regard to the civil war, I, I think the trigger will be, if uh, Gorbachev sees everything slipping, he's going to use the army. And as soon as he uses the army, then someone is going to die and people will resist, whether it's the miners' union, or a better organized democratic uh, organization in Russia, uh, or various ethnic groups that will resist. If uh, I know that if the Soviet army decides to go into Armenia, there will be resistance. Uh, they will not have an easy time. And that means that Soviet citizen in army uniform will have to fight the Armenian citizen. And the Georgians will fight. And next time Azerbaijanis will fight. So it's either a civil war that could be within Russia, which is the more likely, because I don't think the 
Gazakh uh, s citizen is going to attack Armenia knowing what Armenians can do you know, and have decided to do. So it's not going to be uh, easy. But it is more likely that you may have Russia itself split, which was the case in 1917 again. And uh, in which case, it is most likely that there will be a disintegration of the army. And Armenia may escape. Georgia may not escape the civil war. Armenia may escape the civil war because it does not have uh, internal uh, major splits. The Armenian nation is really united at this point. It is. Uh, and it doesn't have ethnic groups to deal with, except the Larapa situation. Yes. Some question, uh, question related to our previous question about the alarming rate of uh, immigration or emigration of Armenia to mm -hmm. this, this country and some European countries. Do you see any trend of stopping uh, that immigration rate? I think if there was some stabilization of the economic situation, I could see it stopping. But uh, the, the uncertainty, uh, the unemployment uh, are very, very serious problems. The immigration poses two problems, one of numbers and of the quality of the people. There, there is, to some extent now, a brain drain. There is a large number of scientists uh, who were employed in the defense industry uh, or in uh, very high-tech industries tied to the Soviet system itself in, through Moscow. Now no longer have projects, contracts, or whatever. So these people are in very, very bad shape. There's nowhere else to go for them because the military production has been cut back tremendously. And uh, there have been uh, some attempts, not well organized, to uh, transform these industries into other industries, other production, but it hasn't happened. Uh, not on a massive scale, not enough to keep those scientists in Armenia. Uh, but I can also imagine that once the economic situation is stabilized, uh, then uh, some of these people may come back. Because the it's not easy to live in Armenia, particularly for those who have a regular income and don't have any extra income. Prices have gone up, as you know, now and from the second. It's very, very tough. But there's also an intensity. Uh, there's also a sense of participating in something which you cannot find anywhere else, not even in Los Angeles, and especially in Armenia. <laughs> yes? Is there a religious tension between Soviet Union and more specifically Islam? Uh, there isn't in and by itself, except that there are undercurrents. Uh, there was some in Armenia, obviously, but this government has tried very hard, and I think succeeded to some extent, in uh, educating Armenians not to see conflicts in terms of Christian versus Muslim, but to see in terms of politics and uh, the, the, the larger sphere or the context of things. But there is no escaping the sense that it is largely the Muslim republics that have now con that constitute now the support of Gorbachev. If you look at the map, it ain't the Baltics, it ain't Moldavia or Ukraine, and it certainly ain't Georgia or Armenia. So the hell, who the hell is left to support it? The Muslim republics. So it is his use of their cultural setting toward his politics that is resented rather than the religion itself. There are other kinds of religious problems. That is, for example, uh, the Armenian Church obviously is the most important uh, uh, religious institution, uh, but it's still lacking spiritualism. So, a number of things are happening. There is Armenian Christian apostolic spiritualism outside the church, such as Khachik Stambul, and whatever. He's a preacher. He preaches, he doesn't need the church. He preaches wherever he is. He's even trying to convince me to become a Christian. <laughs> but he had a very good argument. Last time we had lunch, he, he tried everything, and I said, look, I don't interfere in your beliefs, don't interfere in mine. He said, but Jirai, I care about you, and I have to tell you something now. He says, think of this. No other argument may convince you, but you really have to think about the following. When you die, as you surely will, you will go to hell, as you surely will. But you know what will happen to you. You will be stuck for eternity in the same room with Lenny. <laughs> All of you uh, have an opportunity to talk to uh, 
right on a one-on-one -on -one basis before we uh, break up uh, a small token of our appreciation I'd like to give you the book that we have and uh, I don't think you have them the first one is the nationality factor in Soviet politics and society but I think you'll find interesting Ronald Sonny has a chapter in there among others another is a change of pace uh, it's called Fourth Bazaar, which is a uh, uh, travelogue, if you want to call it, of uh, Hans Christian Andersen when he went through Greece, Turkey, and then using the uh, contact he had with Armenia. And finally, this is the latest book we have published, Hannah's Story, which is the story of Hannah mm -hmm. Thank you. and uh, we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you.